Well, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry for the uh, disruption here in terms of moving ahead, but uh, hopefully the others will join us in a moment. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Gene Levy. Uh, he's well known to many people uh, who've had uh, work with NASA, uh, as he's had uh, quite a, an extensive period with NASA. He, uh, up until recently, was the provost at Rice University, and he was the vision behind the development of the uh, new facility that we've talked about uh, uh, with, uh, with respect to biocollaborative research at Rice, and uh, in which the NSBRI will have, and the Baylor College of Medicine uh, Center for uh, Space Medicine will be housed. Uh, without any further ado, I'd like for Gene to come forward and we'll begin. Uh, thanks, Bobby. Um, so uh, let me just make a, a, a few uh, brief opening remarks. Uh, there were, I, I think we all know, many interesting and informative discussions and panels yesterday. I want to make reference to one getting started. The conference started yesterday morning with what, with, with what I thought was a very informative uh, and valuable scan over the past 50 years. Uh, those 50 years were, of course, the first 50 years of human spaceflight. One of the most important impressions uh, that uh, I took away from, from that session uh, is, uh, is that of the, the, the fact that our perceptions over those 50 years altered in very important ways about the space environment and about our ability to function in the space environment. Uh, we have since shown uh, human beings to be capable of highly productive activity in space. We have also more than demonstrated uh, our ability to project robotically human presence throughout the solar system to myriad planets and planetary systems, as well as to the depths of space itself and to the sun. In fact, most recently uh, uh, to the depths of space exceeding the boundaries of the solar system as we loosely think of the boundaries of the solar system. Uh, the uh, developments, these developments in uh, human operational capability, uh, developments in presence in the solar system, the projection of human presence in space both, direct, both directly and through robotic agents, and the advances in human knowledge are nothing short of extraordinary. Uh, it was remarked yesterday that 500 years from now, uh, when other details of the 20th century have faded to footnotes, it is the expansion of human dominion in space that is most likely to be remembered and celebrated uh, as having characterized the 20th century more than almost anything else. We started the, 20, we started the space age uh, 50 or 60 years ago, for example, with people wondering uh, whether cosmonauts' hearts would race to the point of practically tearing themselves apart upon exposure to the space, to, to the space environment. Others. Uh, uh, insisted, for example, that stepping out on the moon, an astronaut would sink in, out of sight into a deep miasmic fairy castle of lunar dust supported in vacuum by tenuous electrostatic forces. Uh, none of that came to pass. Uh, today we know that the putative dangers uh, of space never materialized in the, in the worst ways that were envisioned, despite the very many real hazards that await us outside the protective cocoon of our familiar terrestrial environment enveloped in this very pleasant atmosphere that is not a characteristic of the planet Earth, but is a characteristic of life, of what life has produced on the planet Earth. Uh, that outside of uh, that protective cocoon of our fami familiar terrestrial environment, space is neither as alien nor as special uh, or as threatening in the sense that many had envisioned. In fact, uh, I don't want to insult space, but uh, in fact, extraterrestrial space is somewhat of a banal place. Uh, although uh, the space uh, environments are indeed hostile and difficult to negotiate, uh, they are not hostile and, and difficult in ways that are, are beyond our capability to deal with. There is relatively little that we cannot contemplate doing in space if we are willing to pay the prices in effort, treasure, time, and risk. 
And if we can convince ourselves, and I want to say this, I think, most importantly, because uh, this, this fact was only touched on uh, in, in this conference, although it is, it is profoundly important, if we can convince ourselves that those prices are commensurate with the returns that we get from space. Uh, it, it, I think we have convincingly uh, developed in the conversation here uh, that uh, indeed those prices are worthwhile, but we, well, let's, let's be sh clear with ourselves, we are the choir. And, uh, and, and as we have sung to ourselves uh, as a choir, we have convinced ourselves of all of the things that we were already convinced of when we walked into the room before the, con the, the conference has started. Uh, I think this is one of our biggest challenges to uh, continue that conversation. As an aside, uh, if you will permit me, I'm, I'm going to say that frankly I'm not convinced that exploration is in our DNA. That is, a, a, I think, a topic uh, that could be a conversation uh, and, to and, and subject of a meeting at least this big, and I would commend us to think about the possibility of having such a meeting in the future. The topic for this fourth panel is, is in the title, Bridging the Sciences in uh, Space Flight, Space Sciences, and Space Exploration. I might offer just a couple of words of explanation uh, for those who wonder about the separate parsing of flight, science, and exploration. Uh, in fact, in an offline conversation after one of yesterday's sessions, uh, I was standing in a little group when uh, one or two people asked why when General Bolden uh, uh, had been asked uh, why General Bolton had made the comment uh, uh, that uh, the, the space station was the, the anchor of exploration, having left out all of the robotic activities that are going on in space. And in fact, the reason for that is that NASA, in its wisdom, uh, parses uh, science, flight, and exploration into totally separate activities. Uh, and what is referred to as exploration is, is the human program. Uh, science and flight are the means and the purposes of carrying out activities in space. Space flight refers to the means of living and traveling, uh, to, from, and in space, space science, and I would add space applications refer to the activities and reasons that make space, uh, that make going to space worthwhile and valuable, and exploration refers to human activities in the NASA vernacular. So in that sense, uh, this session is intended to discuss how it all comes together, uh, how uh, science, flight, and exploration come together to make this wonderful enterprise. And I'm looking forward to the contributions of each of the speakers. We are pressed for time, and uh, I have asked that each speaker uh, confine herself or himself to five minutes. So I'm going to move forward. The first chair is empty, so we'll go to the second chair uh, and, uh, and begin there. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Chris Barber. Um, uh, my background is finance, and uh, from finance I went into high school education. In fact, uh, my last school I turned from a below average school to the most successful pre-A level school in the UK. And my life was trundling along quite nicely, thank you very much, until I had what you could call a summit meeting with uh, George Abbey and cosmonaut general Yuri Glasgow in a pub in Wales. And um, during the course of our summit, they sort of changed my direction. Um, so you might say, well, this is a summit on space medicine. So what's somebody who's experienced his high school education doing here? Um, in the US, you had a, a report, the Augustine Report, Beneath the Gathering Storm. Um, it, has a, it has a sentence which goes something like, the shortage of young people taking up math, sciences, and the technologies poses a greater threat to the United States over the next 25 years than can be conceived by any form of conventional war. In the UK, Gordon Brown had the Roberts Report, which said the similar shortages caused, would cause a retardation in the growth of the UK. In the UK, we've had surveys of science in our schools, which says it's the most boring subject in the, in the school curriculum, followed closely by mathematics. So we are in a form of crisis. Um, so what do we do? 
We seek to do everything we can in a range of things that if I get chance in my five minutes to bore you with, I'll go through the list, um, which actually tries to use the awe and inspiration of the context of space to influence personal development, to increase personal capacity, to increase self-belief and self-confidence, and to raise personal ambitions, particularly in our poorer and more deprived areas, where young people in our poorer and more deprived areas know that there are opportunities out there, but they think that they are for somebody else. And our job, working with people where we've had great support from uh, from George, from Yuri, from uh, the astronaut office in actually getting out there and saying that there are opportunities for you and you can become anything you want. Uh, what sort of programs do we do? We raise money to bring youngsters to the space centres here. Um, in fact, we set challenges. We've ran the UK's most successful uh, schools competition, having over 25,000 young people enter, where we've brought the, uh, the children here. They tell us it's a life enhancing experience. We have teacher education programs here which is the utilization of space in the classroom where we also have programs which actually have school leadership. So we bring school leaders here or would be school leaders to Houston. They work with the schools here, they work with Rice, they work, they work with the astronaut office. Um, they do have a big input usually from Mr. Abbey and most of them recover from that eventually. Um, we, do, we organize astronaut visits to uh, the UK. We also work in India, to India. We take, we take uh, our astronauts into uh, the poorer places. So if I take uh, our, uh, when my last astronaut visit to India was with Joan Higginbottom. We, uh, we, uh, in two days, we visited the president. We made a presentation to the top performing school in India. And we did presentations to schools in the slums of Mumbai all of which had a great effect on everybody that we met. Uh, what else do we do? We have new programs. We have a new program coming up whereby the young people can work with an astronaut and other space dignitaries for a week. They can, uh, they can pick up what we call NASA leadership, NASA team building, uh, what, uh, what sp space can offer the Earth, the environment of space, what makes a great um, experiment. Uh, how space can benefit the Earth, uh, NASA presentation skills, and at the end of that week, they actually come up with an idea for something that, we'll, that could be carried out in space, and we'll take that away, we'll build it, and we have arrangements to have that flown on the ISS. Uh, we have a new program, which is Message to the Moon, where we're, gather we're working with Google XPRIZE, um, companies and we're gathering messages, creative writing crea uh, about what would young people want to leave in a time capsule on the moon and we're gathering those together. We're mixing that with uh, a range of prizes we, uh, p um, and information, newsletters to people. So uh, we also have programs which are mul where we combine space with multimedia education and cognitive acceleration activities to deliver programs in the classroom. Our programs, and this is the amazing thing about a public that's not interested in space, our programs using the context of space really, really work. People say about the programs that happen, they are the best thing that they've ever done. And we tell them that they should get out more. So, my request to you is that myself and people like me on the panel and other people like me that are here, you should really be thinking about what can you do to help us get out to those young people and actually turn them around in terms of wanting to do more in education, more in education, particularly in maths, science and the technologies. Thank you. Okay, my name is Lyudmila Buravkova. I am head of uh, cell physiology lab in Institute of Biomedical Problem. At the same time, I am scientific secretary uh, in this institute and I manage uh, PhD education. Uh, also, I am professor in Moscow State University, uh, biomedical faculty, faculty of basic medicine. 
and uh, I would like to talk about uh, education, uh, developing the next generation and collaboration opportunity for um, uh, young scientists. Uh, unfortunately, I am not native English speaker and let me continue uh, in Russian to express my uh, suggestion. At our institute, uh, we carry out training on four areas uh, of graduate students, uh, aviation, uh, space biology and medicine, physiology, biotechnology, and technical field of uh, um, uh, safety, which uh, includes life support systems. Uh, um, I believe that we have a lucky opportunity to combine those disciplines when the students, engineers who have graduated from technical institutions, when they arrive um, at the institute there, they have the um, opportunity to do scientific research along with the scientists. At the same time, physicians and physiologists are capable of uh, have the opportunity to develop along with engineers, new equipment, new instruments, new engineering systems, new uh, technologies. And this allows also at the level of the laboratory research during the selection of, the, of a discipline of research to combine medical, biological, and engineering goals in a laboratory during performance of graduate work. In addition to that, um, very often a graduate student has two uh, advisors. One of them is a specialist in space medicine and usually is one of the leading scientists of our institute. The other one could be a researcher of, a, of an Academy of Science, Russian Academy of Sciences Institute if uh, he deals with uh, radiation biology or cell biology, but he, he or she can also be a physician who specializes, who is a specialist of the leading clinics of Moscow or of the, or of the Academy of Sciences. This provides an opportunity to demonstrate uh, how the bridges can be uh, created between sciences, which is absolutely necessary for our area, space medicine. On the other hand, if we were to talk about international collaboration, then I think that we should start it as early as possible, including the moment of training at the graduate school and also perhaps uh, during high school uh, or university or during uh, at the entry to uh, entrance to college. It could be done in several ways. For instance, European Space Agency uh, allots travel grants um, for the participation of students and graduate students in international conferences on space medicine. The Russian um, Foundation for Fundamental Research also um, allocates travel grants for young scientists, and it, it could, it, there is an opportunity to use them. Our graduate students take advantage of them um, in order to participate in international symposia such as CASPER, MAF, and others. Uh, in addition, uh, there is a, a number of organizations that organizes conferences for young scientists and specialists in English. And uh, those are international forums. They usually take their conference, school conferences. They usually take place uh, for seven or ten days with participation of international graduate students. Uh, international Space University, our institute, and in addition, in addition, um, bilateral uh, schools or workshops have been conducted lately in Moscow or in Dresden. Um, those are schools or, or workshops that are carried out on a regular basis. Um, I would like to also notice that we use a new forum, new forums that we could use all together jointly, but maybe to ex we can expand them. Those are um, international joint laboratories. Those are virtual labs. Um, they don't have any special buildings, they don't require any special equipment, but the collectives of the teams of two or three institu institutes or universities uh, join their efforts uh, for the 
time period of six or eight years to solve certain issues. Such a laboratory, for instance, has been created the basis of our IBMP and NG medical faculty. As far as the, our department is concerned, we submit and we can submit international grants. We organize uh, joint conferences where um, the majority of presentations is uh, done by students and graduate students. Naturally, professors uh, give lectures. Those are both from our institute and uh, from the Anje University. Um, also, within the framework of such laboratory, we have the capability of exchanging our students and uh, graduate students when they arrive to different uh, uh, different laboratories and where they perform their graduate work, their th when they write their thesis, when they do their research. They can also work on a portion of their PhD in a different lab but in a different country. Um, in addition, Dr. Sutton has already observed that this year we're going to try and organize a PhD fellow uh, program for Russian students here in Houston. Um, I would like to observe that in Russia, such a format um, of participation of young people after PhD as a PhD fellow, postdoc fellow, uh, is not very popular. Um, uh, although at present, the Russian Academy of Science is in the process of creating special program to support young scientists. And I'm hoping that our institute is going to take advantage of that program in order to train young scientists in the area of space medicine. Um, I also have to make an observation that here at this summit, there is a great opportunity for collaboration for young scientists as far as the various space projects are concerned. The, the ones that we haven't talked about yet, those are biological satellites like Bion and Photo, uh, they attract uh, a broad international cooperation. And in this case, it's very important to have participation of young scientists, um, also from the point of view of having a fresh look on things, a fresh view on uh, all the issues. And the experiment that you have heard about yesterday, which is Mars 500, and other integrated or complex experiments are extremely interesting studies, both for young people and in order to popularize, to make it available to the open public to the youth and engage them in those projects. Many young scientists from our institute and from the Russian Academy of Sciences um, participate in that and thus international teams are created and it also two and a half years are uh, allocated for uh, completion of, of such projects and young people propose their own projects and, and their own knowledge. Uh, I would like to get back to yesterday's discussion on the subject of competition. Um, they said that during international cooperation there is no competition. It exists and it will always exist because individual scientists have their own ambitions, labs have ambitions, leading organizations have um, their own ambitions. And you know that ideas can float in the air, but it's important to extract them from the air and to develop them, to deploy them. That's the most difficult part. And, but uh, the, the competition and the collaboration are two sides of the same coin, and we can use it as, you, we can use both of those size as a support in order to make progress in science. But as far as the young people are concerned, uh, concern the competition in their medium is much more intense, trust me on that one. And at, uh, using that platform, we'll be able to further uh, develop space medicine, and this is what we're worried about here, and this is the whole purpose of this summit, and that's why we are all gathered here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Bobby and George for the invitation to be here at this very inspiring meeting. And I hope I can share a few thoughts about the kinds of activities we do. My name is Michael Fennick. I'm from CSIRO, which is the Australian Government Research Institution that covers all areas of science. And what I would like to do is to address the issue about bridging the sciences of radiation biology and nutrition, because that's the field I know something about and I, I can uh, talk, talk about this. And so the focus of, of my, pre my presentation is on the genome ef genomic effects of nutrition and radiation and their interactions. 
Um, I think it's fair to say that damage to the genome is the most fundamental pathology, and it is an important issue not only in space but also on Earth. Um, the reason for that is that damage to the genome has consequences uh, through all stages of life, from infertility development and higher risk for degenerative diseases, not only cancer, but also uh, immune dysfunction and neurodegenerative diseases. Now, what we have been doing since I've joined CSIRO about, about 20 years ago is to use the same diagnostics we use in radiation biology. Um, I've been involved in developing diagnostics in for radiation biodosimetry, uh, which are used uh, uh, when accidents like the Fukushima accident happen, and using those same technologies to study baseline DNA damage in people, in humans. Because unless you understand baseline, you cannot appreciate the impact of environmental factors and put them into context. Now, what we observe is that DNA damage increases with age, uh, very clearly, and within each age group there's a large variation. And that, uh, the reasons for that are really not so clear, but nutrition plays an important role, and that's what we have been studying. Now, we do know also that in astronauts, uh, chromosomal damage damages increase, and, and that is significant. Um, however, whether that is solely due to the um, heavy ions or the galactic type uh, radiations, or whether it's due to other factors, uh, for example, uh, uh, nutritional factors that vary with uh, being in the space environment include micronutrient deficiencies, for example. Microgravity itself, uh, when modeled in vitro, has been shown to depress repair in cells, and there's evidence of more DNA damage. So it's likely to be a combination of factors. And psychological stress, uh, more recently, has been shown to be associated with more uh, genomic instabilities, such as telomere shortening. Now, just to give you an example, we do a lot of modeling studies in vitro, uh, just to do some basic biology. And when we investigate the folate, you know, folate is important for genome maintenance because it, you need it to synthesize the bases to make DNA. And just within the physiological range, the normal range, we see a very uh, sharp dose response such that allowing cells to be at 20 nanomolar folate, which is the concentration most of us would have more or less in the blood, um, causes as much DNA damage as 20 um, centisieverts of radiation, which is at least 10 times the annual allowed exposure limit. So the impacts of inadequate or inappropriate nutrition on the genome is as large as doses of radiation that would be considered unsafe. And therefore, we have to start to understand this and to appreciate it. Now, we, it's not just folate. We have identified nine micronutrients that modify the frequency of DNA damage in humans on Earth. And these include, uh, and these are dietary sources of vitamin E, calcium, folate, retinol, nicotinic acid, uh, as well as rib beta carotene, riboflavin, pantothenate, and biotin. So all of these can impact if they are in, in the appropriate balance. Now, in the space environment, from the papers that have been published so far, um, reductions in the serum concentrations of iron, selenium, zinc, vitamin E, and folate, and red cell folate have been recorded, um, as well as vitamin D uh, reductions. And the oxidative stress levels uh, have increased. So this suggests uh, multiple reasons why DNA damage in astronauts might be increasing, apart from just the radiation environment. And there's likely to be interactions, because we know that the sensitivity to ionizing radiation-induced DNA damage is increased when folate is inadequate, for example, when zinc is inadequate. Um, and, and there are obviously also phytonutrients, like the polyphenols in wine, uh, which can be radioprotective, and we've shown this already. Uh, it's not just us, but uh, there are also other studies. Now, there are also studies in, ast in pilots, which can be informative here, because long-haul uh, pilots and crew uh, experience increased DNA damage as well. And it's been shown in recent studies published just uh, a year or so ago that the DNA damage levels seen in pilots are are associated 
with dietary intakes of vitamin C, E, and carotenoids, that's foods rich in these, as well as niacin, which are exactly the kinds of nutrients we see affecting DNA damage in the general population. So this suggests the possibility that uh, of dietary mitigation, or at least making sure that, first of all, we fix what we can modify. It brings to mind the experiments and studies we did in Belarus when we were studying children exposed to the contamination from the Chernobyl disaster. There was not much you could do about the radiation, but you could modify the diet and explore that. Now, surprisingly, uh, as far as I'm aware, there are not yet any studies on telomeres in astronauts. Telomeres are the ends of chromosomes. They're hexamer uh, repeats, which protect the chromosomes by preventing instability, because if these are not functioning well or absent, the chromosomes stick to each other, and this creates, creates havoc in terms of the stability of the genome. Now, actually, there's a lot of nutrition studies just happening. Uh, just to give you some examples, increased dietary intake of folate, vitamin E, vitamin D, omega-3 fatty acids are associated with longer telomeres, which is the better way to have them, whilst intake of processed meat, high homocysteine, which occurs when folate is deficient, and oxidative stress, obesity, and psychological stress are associated with shorter telomeres. Uh, this is an indication then that these latter uh, factors can accelerate aging. Furthermore, lifestyle-wise, there is now evidence it's just not just nutrition. A recent study with the biomarker that we developed that's been used in Japan in a lifestyle study and occupational study shows that inadequate sleep, uh, very long working hours, insufficient exercise, and unbalanced nutrition all contribute significantly to the DNA damage we see in people. Uh, and therefore, an integrated holistic approach is required to manage and prevent this very important fundamental pathology. And, and I think such experiments in, in, in astronauts um, would be very, very informative. Now, what we have done is, in my lab, we've developed this concept. If you accept that DNA damage to the genome is the most fundamental pathology, then in a preventive sense, we should be in the business of diagnosing and preventing these events from happening in a personalized manner. And what uh, we have developed is, therefore, the concept of the genome health clinic, where this happens. And we've translated this into practice um, through a company in Adelaide called REACH 100. This is still at the beginning, but it's uh, attracting quite a lot of interest. And I note also that Elizabeth Blackburn, who's uh, well known for the Nobel Prize uh, related to her discovery about telomeres, has also uh, it's been this year announced the Telomere Health um, uh, diagnostic capability being available to the general public. <coughs> Therefore, the other issue that I think is of relevance here is that it is evident, even just examining 10 people, 10 females or 10 males, we can find significant differences in the radiation sensitivity of people. So it would be interesting to know to what degree astronauts vary in their sensitivity to the DNA damaging effects of radiation and whether uh, one can uh, mitigate this, these differences uh, by appropriate intervention. We now live in the era where having one's genome is practical, it's not too expensive, and that can provide important information. So the gen genetics will allow us to understand Peter's position. The epigenetics, the marks on the genome that determine gene expression, will allow us to understand programming. And this information will allow us using the transcriptomic and genomic techniques to measure the molecular response and to show efficacy and safety of any intervention we might conceive. So to, co to conclude, we are now really in the f aware that the fields of nutrigenomics, psychogenomics, toxicogenomics, and lifestyle genomics are all relevant for understanding how to prevent damage to the DNA, which is the most fundamental pathology. And I think, to conclude, there are some important knowledge gaps, uh, which, are, which I think are as follows. We still are not certain what are the main causes of increased DNA damage in pilots and astronauts, to what extent it is radiation or diet or other factors. Uh, which dietary and lifestyle strategies in extraterrestrial environments are required for maintenance of the genome integrity? I think we still have a lot to learn. Uh, does the radiation sensitivity phenotype in pilots and astronauts vary greatly? 
and is a personalized diet and lifestyle approach required to optimize the DNA damage mitigation strategy? Thank you very much. I don't know about the rest of you, but that talk scared the hell out of me. Uh, if uh, insufficient sleep, uh, irregular diet, and stress are destroying my DNA, I'm, I'm hoping to make it to 1215. <laughs> That's not that. The rate's not that fast. Uh, so. It depends on how <laughs> much still be around. sleep is involved. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you. Next. Um, th thank you very much. Um, I, I, I apologize in advance for my lack of shirt and tie today. I had a slight wardrobe mis malfunction. Um, I'll try and make up for it by speaking in a very posh British accent for the rest of the talk. Um, if, if, if I look around the room, um, there are too many people to thank. That would take the whole of five minutes. There is almost nobody in the room who I haven't asked for help from or who has helped me in the last 14 years coming to Houston. And if I haven't asked you for help, don't worry, I'll get to you soon. Uh, 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 for, for me, the theme of this conference and this era of human space exploration, space exploration in general, is sustainability and how we move forwards and this becomes something that can be made understood and sustainable so that the science goals can be achieved. Uh, and there have been some changes in the UK that have allowed us to make progress and hopefully uh, I am at the point at which I can repay some of the generosity and patience that people in this room have so far shown me. Uh, we have the newly coined UK Space Agency, represented by Jeremy Curtis here today, uh, which should give us a bit more flexibility, if not more money in the first instance. We have British astronaut working within the European Space Agency now. We have a new government, uh, and we've had a royal wedding. Uh, and, and, and all of these things <coughs> help. Um, uh, in addition to that, I'd like to thank my Russian colleagues, uh, Vadim Gushin and Pr Professor Ushakov, who have... Um, who have actually managed to convince my, my university at the level of the provost's office that space medicine will be a useful thing to do. And that has led to uh, Anna Clark accompanying me on this trip, who is representative of the provost's office, just in case you don't believe me that my, my university is taking this seriously now. Uh, we're here and we're going to set up, we are setting up, we have set up the UCL Center for Space Medicine. Um, uh, on this visit, we've also had very productive meetings with NSBRI and uh, uh, friends at NASA, uh, and we hope to move forwards. Now, the UCL strategy is probably worth describing, so I can tell you where we are hoping to go. Uh, and that really depends... Well, t to understand that, you need to understand the question I, I had to ask myself, which is, what do I need to say and to whom to make this work? And, and and when it comes to government, I needed to say that human space exploration was worth something to the people on the ground beyond what we did for astronauts. Uh, that's what my government at the level of the minister need to hear. At the level of the school children, the next generation of scientists and engineers, they need to hear exploration is in our DNA. And at the level of university undergraduates, postgraduates, and doctoral uh, uh, undergraduates and, and postgraduates, they need to hear that space exploration is worth something to the people on the ground and exploration is in our DNA. Uh, and so the, the strategy really depends upon making those points known. So the, f the core of it is really for us is gonna be about health innovation. Uh, I talked a little yesterday actually with, with Charlie about disruptive processes and I think this is where we're at here. But one of the unique selling points for me in the space program is that you bring engineers, physicists, medics, uh, life scientists all together and very often co-locate them in a way that doesn't exist in almost any other industry. And certainly uh, NASA uh, and the other international agencies, IBMP, have learned how to do that very successfully over the years and that should be exploited. Now UCL has world-class medicine, uh, physics, astronomy, life science and engineering. Uh, and uh, having learnt from those processes, we hope to bring that stuff together at UCL to, to generate health innovation. I'd like to give you two very quick examples of uh, innovation projects that are live at the moment. 
we uh, have worked with the Open University with a very specialized mass spectrometry device that was put into the Beagle lander that got to Mars just in quite a few pieces. Um, but we have taken that technology and used it to try and use as a near patient, near patient testing device to identify and speciate blood-borne pathogens. We're on the way with that at the minute. So we're hoping we'll have some success with that. And the second one is data mining. We've taken some astrophysics data mining techniques uh, that have been used for about 40 years by the astronomy community to take multi-channel data and mine them. You analyze those data sets for their differential properties. Uh, to tr and, and the solar physics group have used that to try and predict solar flares. I think, it is my hypothesis, that if we can effectively archive intensive care data uh, and then analyze that data set, paying attention to the differential components, uh, we may or we may be able to try and get an idea of, of whether or not we can predict catastrophic events in the patient. Those two are live. Neither of them involve human sp uh, space flight. That's because we don't have any in the UK. I will be coming here and going to Russia and to Europe for that. Um, but we hope to move on in that vein. Um, that's the innovation core, and we think we can get some sustainable funding for that at home. Um, on the education front, we're continuing with the undergraduate program at UCL that we have for the last 10 years that grows the next generation uh, and with our elective programs, uh, both here and abroad, uh, elsewhere, to get the next generation of people through. And Harriet Cullen is here. She's one of our trainee doctors in the UK. Uh, she went through Kennedy Space Center a few years ago. She has qualifications. She has a PhD in astrophysics and medicine and exactly the sort of person we want to bring through for this innovation program. And finally, we'd like to use both of those things to produce a sustainable environment so that we can prosecute our interests in exploration, which we couldn't otherwise do in the UK. That, that is the plan. Um, I'd like to wrap up by saying that I don't think that this can be done uh, in the UK by any group alone, that I think that there's not enough of us. And here, actually, there are representatives, my friends, Steve Harridge from King's College, uh, London, but also uh, uh, representatives from Swansea University, Southampton University. We all are going to have to form a consortium so that we can bring this forwards. Um, but I, I think that that's the way forwards, uh, and I, I think that that's how we're going to do it. Uh, and, and essentially, if we can make that work, then finally, the UK will be open for business when it comes to human space exploration. Thank you. Thanks, for, thanks very much. Yes. First, I'd like to thank Mr. Abbey and Dr. Alford for inviting me to the conference and to speak. It's a great opportunity, and I'll be speaking on education and developing the next generation of space medicine physicians. I did meet with the interpreters, and unfortunately, they don't have the ability to translate from Oklahoman into English, so we'll have to do, do the best that we can. Uh, at UTMB, we've been training space medicine specialists uh, since 1993. And when I say that, you might remember Sam Poole mentioned yesterday about the space doctor for exploration or going to Mars or other things. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the people that take care of crew members in, in space from Earth. Uh, we've had 24 of the physicians we've trained who've gone to work for NASA and five have become astronauts. And, and it's interesting, and I don't know how this will translate into Russian, but the talent level of the residents who are seeking out space medicine is scary in that they're just so good. It's unbelievable. And part of that is the dream to be able to fly in space sometime on their own. And we encourage that. We think it's a good deal. And we think when they do make astronauts, they'll be dandies. Uh, we also try to do things internationally, and I'll get into some of the limitations, but we have had uh, residents and students from JAXA and ESA uh, attend our sh short course, which is a four-week course that lasts for, uh, uh, that we've had about 20 different countries represented in our short course. And of course, we do other things like our Grand Rounds that was mentioned earlier. Our Grand Rounds is available live each month worldwide. It's also available on the internet that way, and you can do it through teleconferencing and actually ask questions and do those sort of things, and then it's archived through the USRA's website. So we do what we can internationally. Uh, our feeling about space physicians is that first, they need to be good physicians. We think it's critical that they have good clinical skills. We don't think a one-year internship and then a, an MPH and a little practicum is enough. So all of our residents either come in with a specialty area or, uh, that they've already done, or they uh, do a combined program with a primary care area and space medicine. After that, things that 
you come to mind are the areas like space physiology. They do need to understand the 50 years of data we have, what happens to normal people when they're exposed to the environment of space. They also need to understand the space environment and what the space environment means, whether it's radiation or reduced pressure or all the things that you're familiar with. Another thing that we really think is critical and important is that they get a science appreciation, that they understand studies, how to interpret studies, but more than that, know how to interact, interact with scientists or pure scientists who are doing the work in space because so many times we're a, a partner with them and they need to have an appreciation for that process and appreciation for the individuals that do that. And NSBRI has been uh, critical in doing that. They have provided some fundings for our residents to do uh, science and do research on their own. And we think that's critical for their career uh, as they progress forward. Telemedicine, we think, is a very important thing. We're lucky at UTMB that, tel that UTMB does 6,000 telemedicine consultations each month. The, they were at one time the biggest provider in the world in telemedicine, and that's what we're really doing when we take care of people in space is, is telemedicine. We think international medicine is critical. The Russian Space Agency, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, has been critical in helping us in that area. We also think that the psychology aspect of training is, is also critical. And I don't mean taking care of someone with schizophrenia or those sort of things. I'm talking about human performance, interaction, uh, remote uh, uh, operations, these sort of things. That uh, This is really uh, a very, very important area in taking care of crew members in low Earth orbit and also for exploration. We also are very interested in what's called point of injury care, which is totally different than most medicine. Most doctors work in an emergency room or in a hospital, the patient comes in and they start to take care of them. But when you work in Kazakhstan or you work at a, a launch and landing site, you're on scene, you're doing on scene care and that takes special training. Uh, and also when you're in a helicopter, say in Kazakhstan, it may be, you know, two hours to get to a definitive facility if you get in an airplane and fly back to to Moscow or other places, you're talking another three hours. They need to know how to take care of initial injuries. It's a little bit different. We've been lucky to have wonderful partnerships to accomplish what we do with NASA, who provides the funding for our program. Uh, the international partners, uh, as NSBRI, as I mentioned, Wally Life Sciences and our integrated engineering has been critical, and also the Russian Space Agency. And when combined with commercial space flight, You'd be surprised, we've been able to get four of our residents to Baikonur for launches. We've been able to have residents at IBMP doing medical evaluations in Moscow, and we've had several who work at the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center through NASA and Wiley and the Russian Space Agency learning about the international aspects of the space program. We consider this critical. We have some limitations uh, that I don't need to spend too much time on. We have a lot of bosses. Uh, our residents have to go through the American Board of Preventive Medicine, the, uh, the CEPH, which is an accrediting agency, the ACGME, which accredits residencies, our graduate school, the state medical boards. And anytime you have that many people telling you what to do, you lose a little something. And our training isn't perfect for space medicine physicians, and I, I really wish that it were. Because of our NASA funding, we really can't take residents from other countries, and that's a uh, been a, a problem. Uh, also, we have some trouble every, every once in a while getting people onto training sites. If we have international people getting them onto NASA training sites. So we're somewhat limited. So one of the things that we're, we'll be starting probably around January is a diploma course, which will get rid of all those things and just teach what we really need uh, for space medicine physicians. And we're, there's been great enthusiasm from the international partners in doing that. And just a couple of minutes on commercial space flight, which really isn't very much a, a part of this uh, uh, meeting, but uh, really commercial space flight opens up a new paradigm. We're in the fi last 50 years, we've taken care of generally healthy people going into space. Now, there's, as you all know, there's quite a few people who aren't that healthy, but we don't really get much chance to study those or know that much about those. For example, we mentioned Parkinson's disease uh, earlier in this, and after 20 years, I got a call from one of the astronauts that to talk to a news person who was going to come by and talk about his Parkinson's disease. And uh, finally, that's out in the open, but it was 20 years later. Uh, and so there's so many things that do happen, but no one knows about it. But commercial space flight gives us the opportunity to study people with medical conditions. And uh, you have to really respect and admire the courage 
of the Russian Space Agency, who's flown multiple spaceflight participants. They've flown eight flights with uh, space adventures, and not only were there eight flights, there were also five backup crew members. And one of the things you find is to come up with $200,000 for a suborbital flight, or 30, 20 to 30 to 40 million for an orbital flight, is you give up your youth and your health in order to come up with that kind of money. And I don't think the Russian Space Agency took big risks. They spent years looking at risk mitigation and understanding the medical conditions in these people. And they're to be applauded, I think, because when people go to Mars or when people get sick on the International Space Station, we have absolutely no knowledge of how to treat illness in space. And this has opened up the door for that. Not only that, these individuals allow us to publish their story because astronauts have the Privacy Act, they also have career interests. We've been able to publish the story on these people that it's out there for all the investigators, for all the scientists, for all the physicians to look at. And we're learning dramatically how to take care of illnesses, how our medications work in space. And uh, the international partners, and particularly the Russian Space Agency, deserve the credit for that. Uh, the, the other thing is that these folks, and I, again, I'll, I'll finish, I've got an amount of time, I think, but uh, they do offer the opportunity for science. I don't know how many of you followed Richard Garriott's story, but you know, when he goes up, he really doesn't have any duties to the vehicle, and his data are published, but the amount of science that he was able to do in a 12-day mission, whether it was protein crystal growth, earth observation, the medical experiments that he did for Korea, for the ESA and for NASA, uh, uh, it was amazing uh, how much he got done in one short mission, and he paid his way to go. And so it wasn't at any ex huge expense to any of the other international partners. So we're going to have this raft of people now who want to fly into space who have medical conditions. And the physicians that take care of them are going to need to know all the other stuff, but they're going to need to know how to take care of people who have medical conditions. And that's one of the reasons we really want uh, clinical skills. I'm a little worried about the job outlook right now for people in our program. I th commercial space flight hasn't quite picked up yet. And we really, there's a lot more opportunities that are being used. I reviewed the STS-35 mission and uh, if something happens to the RCC or the uh, tiles on that mission and they have to camp out, we're going to have 10 individuals on the International Space Station some of them are going to be there way beyond the U.S. experience base, not the Russian experience base, but they're going to be beyond the U.S. experience base. And there's not a physician on board, 10 people, up to a year, no physician. And the truth is, as you start going to cruise of six, you start doing exploration, we need a few more physicians. I think there's an advantage in having physicians. Now, I'm not naive. We've had, I was a crew surgeon on a mission, had a physician on board and a, and a crew medical officer who was a shuttle commander. The entire crew went to the commander for their medical care, not the doctor. And so not every doctor is God's gift to the universe. Not every time are they a good deal, but in general, you'd have less likely having a physician being the eyes, ears, the remote guidance from a specialist on earth than someone else. And just to give you an example of that as I close, uh, Richard Garriott was participating in Clarence Sam's experiment, and at the end of the flight, they needed to draw blood. They stuck him eight times, didn't get a drop of blood out of him. And if you think non-physicians can do these things, it's not that easy. And uh, that's why we put IO needles and things on board. But physicians do give you some capabilities that uh, non-physicians have. It affects the science, I think. I think that they're important for the science. And so uh, uh, we're excited. I think we're training good people. I think there's going to be a real role for physicians, both on the ground and in space. And uh, I'll answer questions at the end. Thank you. We, we, we are, uh, w with discipline, we, we will not fall off the edge of the world at, uh, as, as the clock comes up to 1215, but thank you all. Next. Yeah. Good morning. What I'd like to talk about today are some uh, guiding principles of uh, specialist training uh, in the interest of developing space programs. When we train our specialists, we need to uh, answer a couple of questions and then set our goals and objectives. What kinds of specialists do we need to train?
энциклопедически образованных uh, do they need to be uh, людей, broadly educated a walking encyclopedia ready and capable to work in any uh, scientific field there's a saying in Russia uh, this kind of person is a jack of all trades he needs to be able to do uh, he will be able to do anything to bake bread to make clothing uh, to play violin at the end of the day or rather do we need specialists that would be uh, narrowly trained very specialty oriented uh, specialists that are, have uh, deep insight into their uh, respective field back in the Soviet Union we had uh, a top of the line uh, training uh, technique in uh, philosophy overall that was based that was based on uh, the availability of uh, center of excellences in the education field uh, the scientific leaders in their fields uh, headed those schools many of them uh, the older generation at least uh, know very well are very well known uh, Chernigovsky, Krebs, Amberi Barin, Petrovsky, Oleg, uh, Oleg Godzenko, all academicians. Uh, the latter uh, has uh, until recently been the, uh, the co-author of the Russian-American publication, until recently. So what happened after the demise of the Soviet Union? Yesterday uh, it was mentioned that there's a possibility of brain drain. Unfortunately, uh, uh, back home in our country we know this uh, firsthand. When you have your well-trained specialists of uh, creative age leave their work sites and take off. And currently, and it's an unfortunate uh, fact, that they were able to monitor this process at the Russian Academy of Sciences premises. I have to to uh, admit to you that, regrettably, um, even though the brain drain uh, has already peaked uh, back in the uh, 90s, uh, we, haven't, uh, we haven't seen the end of that yet. So what's happening right now? It's that all the science bodies and education centers, even though they're, uh, they have very well uh, trained institute level specialists, uh, at the same time, do not have the capabilities to continue on uh, in the more specialized field, seeing as the uh, creative age of a scientist from uh, you know when they're 40 when they're 50 they've left and it's the older generation that was left to uh, tend the flock they weren't there to train uh, population control is also something that's a major issue for our country to this very day even though uh, on May 9th uh, we celebrated uh, quite a fantastic uh, anniversary of the victory in the uh, Great Patriotic War. Even though we've done that, we still still have not uh, pulled through the demographic uh, losses that we that, were, that occurred to us 60 odd years ago. At the intervals of 25, 30 years, we're still uh, going through reductions of the younger generation. And uh, this is the, the pit that we have not been able to crawl out of. Uh, having said that, we uh, would like to do the following. We would like to see the following. We would like for our younger uh, men and women to be participating in international cooperation. Uh, this is a uh, hard requirement for us, if you will. Not only the IBMP uh, that's already been mentioned by uh, Ludmila, my colleague, but also all the uh, physiological uh, oriented institute uh, that are part of the Russian Academy of Science. We're trying to provide the permanent education, the continuous education that include uh, training the young specialists from uh, school age, then we take them uh, through institute, college and institute level, uh, BA and MA programs, then uh, working them all the way through the uh, PhD level. In other words, from the younger uh, age, we try to uh, instill in them, uh, in these young scientists to be. A, we try to instill in them. Uh, the need to work, uh, need to work hard, B, we try to instill in them uh, the appreciation of the qualification that's within their reach. Uh, something else would like, I'd like to touch upon that hasn't been uh, mentioned yet.
We are feeling, and it used to happen, and we're trying to uh, we're trying to bridge this right now. I'm talking about using the analog systems to train uh, uh, space uh, specialists. I'm talking about mountainous areas. Uh, that's great for hypoxia studies. We've had uh, Antarctic uh, surveys and uh, expeditions, and our scientists work, uh, working hand in hand with our uh, crews and came up with great results. They were basis for our uh, understanding of the uh, adaptability uh, limits for human body in harsh environments. Uh, low oxygen, lower temperatures uh, are some of the uh, uh, properties of the environment. Anomal situations happened there as well when we had a fire, when we had a fire at the uh, station. And our scientists, as well as uh, the doctors, being uh, equal on par members of the crew, when they were saving the equipment required for uh, life support, provided uh, top of the line, top notch support in the uh, primary care that was so much needed right then, right then. And we think that these pieces of the puzzle need to be brought together and put together uh, and geared at training uh, space physiologists and medical professionals. The last thing I'd like to mention goes without saying that international cooperation uh, comes with its own set of uh, commitments. Will there be competition? Probably, more likely than not, because it's uh, part of human nature. Then again, when we become partners, when we enter into a cooperative mode, an equal cooperative mode, I want to emphasize, when we do that, we take upon ourselves certain obligations and commitments that in return require that we be open, that we treat ourselves and each other as equal, and be open-minded and be able to listen to the partners. And it goes without saying that the century that's now past us uh, will serve as a living reminder to uh, the generations to come of the fact that uh, humans walked on the moon. And I uh, know very well that the uh, science corporations of each respective countries that are tied into their powers that be, that in turn formulate to them that it's the it's this particular nation's science field is uh, the fastest, the deepest, the greatest, and so on and so forth. With that in mind, when we come together at summits such as uh, this, and when we're given the possibility to uh, provide a uh, clear, lucid uh, status of, uh, of scientific matters, we need to admit that uh, the moon on the walk, uh, the walk on the moon would not have been possible had it not been for Yuri Gagarin's flight. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, why don't we go to Jeff? Uh, I just want to make a comment. Jeff, uh, yesterday, before Charlie Bolden spoke, you uh, allocated him as much time as he wanted. I'm not reciprocating. <laughs> I, I understand. <laughs> um, well, I'd like to make just a, a few comments that address the topics related to education uh, as it pertains to the bridging of the sciences. And like uh, many of us here uh, have uh, broad uh, scientific interests and was inherently conflicted when starting out as to whether or not to focus in the life science area or in the physical science area. And I could not resolve this conflict. Uh, so I started off in mathematics and physics and then studied medicine and then, uh, in, in my view, went forward and studied uh, theoretical physics and then did a PhD. Uh, according to my friends and family, I went back. Uh, I uh, had comments like, uh, what happened to him? He was so smart. Um, and, uh, but I had a very benevolent uh, mentor who had a PhD in nuclear physics, and he took me under his wing. And, uh, and I went forward, and there was not a focus on space. Uh, at that time, but later on it turned out to be very valuable to have had uh, formal training uh, there, uh, in both areas. 
Um, there weren't really a lot of MD, PhD programs at that time. Uh, there are quite a number of them now uh, in many countries. Um, and I think that uh, many of the sciences on the physical side and on the life science side have uh, bridged together and become integrated and whole new fields have emerged. Uh, in biotechnology, uh, tissue engineering, and so forth. And uh, the comment that was made earlier that those folks who work in the space area uh, in the various agencies, uh, also on the commercial side, uh, and certainly in academia, uh, we really do see a lot of interdisciplinary uh, activity. In fact, it's so inbred now um, that that we just all kind of take it for granted. Uh, there's emergence of centers which inherently become interdisciplinary. At NSBRI, we have integrated inter interdisciplinary teams that work in uh, topic areas. And with our education programs, they're also interdisciplinary. We have a national graduate education program, uh, a national postdoctoral education program, uh, that are uh, interdisciplinary. Uh, Richard talked about how it is that NSBRI wanted to uh, have uh, research opportunities for the next generation of flight surgeons. Uh, we've seen uh, growth in, uh, in a variety of other programs. And I think all of this is really terribly exciting that the students come from, from different disciplines. They, they energize us. They force us to, uh, to uh, open new areas and, and be creative. And Ludmila talked a little bit about the postdoc exchange program between uh, NSBRI and IBMP. And here's another example of where it is that not only are we trying to do uh, international collaboration on exchange, which is very important, and uh, not only to instill in the next generation this sense of uh, uh, diminished boundaries between disciplines and uh, between countries, uh, but also to look in a complementary way at what it is that the two sides bring on a case-by-case -case basis for the students. So that the, and this is low end, but it's a place to start uh, for the two students are coming. They did their PhDs in space uh, biology and space physiology. And the laboratories that are going to are highly technical laboratories. One is in uh, bioengineering, uh, and the other is a laboratory that deals with uh, biomedical um, uh, biophysics, but it has a very heavy slant on state-of-the-art uh, medical imaging. And the idea here is that what the, the students are going to be exposed to uh, new areas, and they're going to br learn new skills and bring those skills back uh, with them when they go to IBMP. But what happens is that the laboratories that they've gone to are going to be energized in the space area because they're not inherently uh, laboratories that do anything related to uh, space life science or space medicine. And so I think that this is a wonderful way of uh, bridging the sciences, of uh, bridging our institutes, and very importantly, uh, of bridging uh, the corporate memory and knowledge and experience that exists here in this room of, of our generations uh, with the new generation that's coming forward. And I think it's very difficult to overestimate the value that that brings. So I'll my comments there. Thank you. Hello. My name is Vladimir Sychov. I represent uh, IBMP, and uh, I probably will be out of the framework of the general context because I'll be speaking about uh, rather about exploration than education. Yesterday, when they were talking about. Um, what is an obstacle to fly into deep space, uh, then the main emphasis was made on um, radiation components. Um, it's unquestionably true that radiation outside of the magnetic poles of the Earth is going to be different. We don't quite understand what it's going to be. But there was a phrase that sounded that from the medical point of view, today everything is fine and we're ready. 
but I would like to say that medicine is not only about health of a human being, not only about the body but, and its organs, but also about the state of environment in which he or she lives. And today, by default, everyone understands that the environment that exists on the station is a normal environment, and that it's going to continue uh, being that way uh, in deep space flights. However, this is not quite so. Right now, during the communication with the Earth, the crew um, receives fresh produce on a regular basis. And uh, today we were told that we need a necessary dose of certain vitamins. If you're talking about 520 days to Mars, we have to have a full su supply. And who can guarantee that frozen food is going to maintain its properties or freeze-dried food? Or those vitamins that they're going to bring with them, that they're going to maintain their biological bioactivity. So we have to think about the life support systems where there would be some other methods of, of the environment regeneration um, used. But I'm talking about those systems which include biological processes. Naturally, at a space vehicle, to create such a system is impossible, but uh, some of the elements of those systems could be initiated. But first of all, uh, it would be plants which provide the greatest part of the, all the necessary um, components to maintain, sustain our health, vitamins, biologically active elements, and microelements. And the issue is what do we have to research on board the ISS? Um, uh, I was listening to them, and I remembered how 20 years ago I went to NASA headquarters um, uh, on the subject of negotiations of plant, growing plants in space. And um, I found out that there are two departments at NASA. One department is researching fundam doing fundamental research, and the other one is researching um, plants as part of the life support system. And uh, here we have a super important task. We need to apply this research not only to um, basic sciences, not because we're only interested in a single process, but we need to have an application so that we have a realistic, a tangible uh, outcome. Come. And this concerns all of the issues reviewed here, but as far as plants are concerned, it's impossible to do plant research as far as the separate individual processes are concerned. You have to um, investigate the entire complex, and um, in addition, for that very plant, you would have to create the habitat conditions, the same as we create for a human being. And so plants would probably require studies the same as we do for the humans, like radiation effects. And we're to, when we're talking about space radiation, it's not just that it's a different kind of radiation, it's a different spectrum that we do not observe here on Earth, and it has a totally different effect on the organism. As an example, being for one month of uh, embryonic cells of animals in space leads to the fact that the second uh, generation, due to parthenogenesis, um, starts a sexual propagation. Um, and so there is a substance that receives a compound and then it transfers it to the next generation. This is not simple by any means. And nevertheless, it exists that we have investigated that. Um, there are also new, new life support systems. Without them, uh, we won't be able to fly too far away from Earth. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jim Tour. I'll talk about the, uh, the crossing of education between academia and, and the space sciences uh, just by telling you two, two short stories. <clears throat> uh, at, at one point, I had a, a, a lot of interaction with people from NASA and, and continue to, and for many years being here at Rice. And at one point, they came to my office shortly after the, the, the disaster where there was a, a break in the in the wing of <clears throat> one of the the, uh, the shuttles, and it broke up actually over the state of Texas as it was landing. <clears throat> and I asked them, how do you do remote repair? Because many of these materials you have to, um, you have to cure at over a thousand degrees to get them to cure, and I knew particularly the NOAX that was used uh, between the shuttle tiles. 
And they said, well, if we have to do a repair, we always bring up NOAX with us, <clears throat> but uh, we hope that it would cure upon reentry. <clears throat> and I thought, well, that's, uh, that's a difficult way to think of something curing. And we had done a lot of work with nanotubes, and shortly before that, I had asked some students to put some nanotubes in the microwave oven and tell me what would happen. Tell me what happened, and they came back. They said uh, it exploded. I said, that's wonderful. They're great microwave absorbers. So we had a, a very quick discussion and a collaboration and resulted in a paper where we were able to take NOAX and add 0.75 weight percent of multi-walled carbon nanotubes that are produced in over 500 tons a year just add a small amount of that to the NOAX, 300 seconds of 30 watt microwave. Typical microwave oven in a kitchen is about 1200 watts. So just 30 watts of microwave, very low power. And we could get that to cure over a thousand degrees in 300 seconds using a small microwave source. So that, that's an example when there's good communication between those who, who have a need and, and people in academia, I think things can actually rapidly occur. And, and, and that collaboration read, led to a quick publication. I'll tell you one other story, which, which was really quite unfortunate and, and was not the case. We, 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 I'm sure all of you would, would, would uh, uh, likewise be pained as I was. And that's to show you what not to do. And this is more for, for people who would run large programs or for uh, people involved in government. Uh, in 2005, we had a large grant at NASA, at, at, um, at, at Rice from NASA. It was a $15 million grant to build an armchair quantum wire, which was a, a uh, uh, material that, that would conduct very high electricity and, and high amounts of electricity and be very lightweight based on carbon nanotubes. And uh, Rick Smalley, who was the PI on that grant, died uh, of leukemia on October 28th, 2005, at around noontime. Uh, he had 35 people in his group, uh, about half of them professional staff, uh, many of them PhDs, and about half of them graduate students. And at 3 o'clock on October 28th, there was an immediate stop spending order on that grant. So eventually the university asked me to take over his program and see the students through, and I thought, okay, well, we have this grant. We're only six months into this four-year grant or five-year grant, and, and uh, we'll see the students through. And then I learned that um, there had been immediate stop spending order. I couldn't even pay the salaries at the end of that day. Uh, what that did was that, that, that was a problem that arose, uh, uh, that, that was a problem that, that occurred, and... Um, uh, it left certainly bad taste in the, in the professor's uh, uh, view of what would happen, of what happened, but more so it, uh, it impacted the students. The students who were there felt like if this is what research is, if this is what programs are, where we work so hard to build these programs and six months into it, there can be immediate stop spending order, which I've never seen from any other institution. Uh, uh, none of those students went on into academic careers, none of them because they felt that this was, this was too hard. And this, again, underscores the fact that, that we need sustained funding in fundamental research, because as students see what, what goes on, they make decisions as to what they're going to do in the future. In fact, this has affected our Russian colleagues much more than American colleagues. I collaborate a fair amount with folks at Moscow State University, and the, the talent there is absolutely extreme beautiful, wonderful people with enormous talent. But the continuity of funding is, is, is just not there. And it's so sporadic that they cannot get their research done. So I feel that as a nation, if we're really going to sustain our programs here and have the right people coming forth, it's really important that we communicate the importance of keeping sustained funding so that students understand that, that there are careers here that we can embark on. And I have no problem writing grants, and I do that all the time, and I'm not complaining about that. In fact, it makes me a better researcher to write grants. And even at my stage, only one in five of my proposals is funded. And I'm okay with that. I may, am, am able to survive. I just write a lot of proposals, therefore. Uh, but we deal with that. But there has to be a continued and sustained funding mechanism in order to have good science translating into space. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. 
I just want to underscore Lester be any misunderstanding that the stop spending order did not come from the institution, it came from the agency. Yes, the stop spending order was not from Rice. Uh, uh, Gene was provost. Gene actually had to pick up $350,000 as I tried to pull this thing out of, out of its demise. Thank you, Gene. Money well spent. Uh, thank you all. We, we are very short on time, and uh, as a consequence, if I allow questions, uh, Bobby Alford is probably going to have my skin. Um, so let me uh, thank uh, the audience uh, and the speakers, uh, and, then, and then we will adjourn. I, I, I will take, um, though, though, the privilege of owning the microphone for another five seconds uh, to, to maybe pose a broad question that uh, I think maybe is worth thinking about uh, in this afternoon's discussion groups. And, and that uh, I would say that given that the subject of this uh, session ha was bridging, or what I would call integration, uh, across uh, the various components of uh, the NASA space program, uh, uh, propulsion, uh, exploration, science, uh, I, I would ask you to think about whether or not we have, both in the current program and in the, in the program as it in, is envisioned to unfold in the future, whether we, are, we have and are contemplating the right mix, uh, the right mix of uh, focus on propulsion, <coughs> focus on exploration with human beings, and focus on uh, what I'll call science, the way NASA disaggregates science and exploration uh, with robotic systems. And whether, whether or not that mix is as effective as it needs to be uh, to meet the needs of our society and the aspirations of our, I should say, our societies together, I think is a, is a question worth all of our contemplation. With that, let me thank you all for your time and attention. And let me thank the speakers. Yeah, let me have your attention. Uh, the reason we don't want you to leave right now is that we had planned a, a part of the program. Uh, we had planned a part of the program that would uh, give us the opportunity to uh, receive a mission report status uh, from Mike Coates. And he's here, and he also has a very tight time bind, so he knows 12.30 is our end time. <laughs> which is uh, critical, but uh, we thought we would go ahead and proceed with that right now. So, Mike? As you all know, Mike Coates is the director of the Johnson Space Center, an astronaut. He's done a superb job in managing that very important uh, post that he has. And Mike, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Bobby, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, I know you're all hungry, so I'll talk fast uh, here. Uh, 2011 has been uh, a year of transition for JSC. Uh, we have 12 astronauts, cosmonauts, uh, circling above us up here right now, as, as most of you know, Expedition 27 crew. Uh, we've got U.S. astronauts Katie Coleman and Ron Guerin up there, and of course we have the shuttle crew uh, commanded by uh, Mark Kelly uh, up there as well. Uh, it's exciting for us, and I hope most of you know, and if I'm uh, explaining the obvious to you, please bear with me. I know some of you are more involved in the space program uh, than others. Uh, this is an exciting mission for us. Not only are we delivering uh, a whole shuttle full of supplies uh, up to the space station, which are certainly uh, badly needed, but we, we delivered the alpha magnetic spectrometer. And that's exciting for all of us. Uh, it's already detecting things like dark matter and antimatter and, and things that uh, somebody else is going to have to explain to you, but I know are going to be fascinating uh, for all of us, because all of us in this space business are absolutely uh, fascinated with everything to do with space physics uh, out there, and we're learning so much uh, on every mission we have up here. We also have, and I want to emphasize, almost 150 experiments going on in the International Space Station at any one time. That's an awful lot of work, and the crews are awfully busy up there. And we're learning so much about how the body uh, functions in the space environment, zero gravity space environment up there. Uh, and that's so important for us. I know you've heard uh, people talk uh, yesterday and today 
Uh, but we're learning some things, uh, it seems like every day, that we had no idea are going on even a year or two ago uh, about the human body. And if we're going to explore, and we are going to explore beyond Earth orbit, uh, boy, we've got to learn how to be self-sustaining for uh, very extended periods of time. Uh, and we will need a physician along, I think, Richard. I'm, I'm glad you volunteered. I appreciate that a lot. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say the Johnson Space Center, uh, I believe, is going to be continue to be at the forefront of, uh, of human space exploration out here. The International Space Station, as you know, is, uh, I believe, uh, the finest laboratory or collection of laboratories uh, in the world. Uh, and they're doing just amazing things uh, up there. We're very, very busy at the Johnson Space Center. The Authorization Act, and I'm sure Charlie will talk about that uh, this evening, uh, challenged uh, NASA and Charlie and all of us uh, to establish a program that does several things. One is to foster the commercial space transportation industry. Uh, and that's important for us. Uh, I believe firmly that we're to the point uh, in our uh, life cycle of our space program where we can turn over access to low Earth orbit to the commercial companies. They're going to be flying later this year, uh, taking cargo up there. In a few years, they'll be able to take crews up there. I'm very anxious to turn it over to them as soon as they've demonstrated their capability so that NASA can focus on other things beyond uh, exploration, beyond Earth orbit uh, out there. Uh, so we're doing some things like developing a, a heavy lift vehicle. Uh, we've been studying this uh, for uh, a long time to come up with the, the most affordable, feasible architecture uh, for developing a heavy lift vehicle. We want to continue to develop the multi-purpose crew vehicle that this Authorization Act uh, challenges us to do that, uh, which will take us beyond low Earth orbit uh, out there. And that's, that's going to be very uh, challenging for all of us because it's, and I want to emphasize again, how we've got to be self-sustaining, totally self-sustaining for the first time in human history. Okay, for extended periods of time, we've got to have everything with us that we need. We've got to recycle the air, the water, everything we possibly can because we're a year or more from home, from help, for the first time in human history. When we're up on a station, up on a uh, space shuttle, we practice. Charlie and I practice doing emergency deorbits. We could be down in less than an hour if we had to. Okay? Same thing with a space station. They've got rescue vehicles up there, Soyuz vehicles. They could bring you home uh, in an hour if it was really necessary uh, to bring you home. Even when we were walking on the moon, two and a half days from home, if you had a problem, which we demonstrated with Apollo 13. Okay? Boy, when we fire those engines to go beyond low Earth orbit, wherever we're going out there, we're a year or so from home. You don't turn around and come back. So we've got an awful lot of work to do to prove that we can exist and live in space for extended periods of time. So the things we're doing on the International Space Station right now are so important. We haven't yet mastered recycling air, recycling water, uh, but we're getting there. We're learning. We're improving those every day, and that's exciting for us. Uh, the collaboration with our international partners, with industry, with academia, uh, is just so important to us. Uh, it is fun for me. When I came back to NASA from after 14 years in industry, uh, and they sat down and started explaining, first of all, what a shuttle mission was going to do as we finished assembly of the space station, I, my first reaction is, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, they had so much packed into every shuttle mission uh, up there. I said, wow, what are your contingency plans? Well, they had contingencies for virtually everything. They had planned these missions out so minutely. It was astounding, and I'm just amazed in the last five and a half years they pulled off these missions just like clockwork. Um, it's a beautiful thing to watch. We are, we're working to identify new partnerships, if you will, with academia, with industry, with nonprofit organizations, with community groups, uh, and I've got a, an active group of people uh, working on that at JSC. Uh, we're looking for innovative solutions for sustainability of life in space. The, uh, 
We're trying very hard to transition the Orion uh, vehicle as part of the Constellation program to the multi-purpose crew vehicle. Uh, we're trying very hard to uh, emphasize a new technology, investing in new technology uh, developments, both with the Office of, of Chief Technologist at NASA <coughs> and the Advanced Exploration Systems uh, funding, if you will. Uh, again, we're <coughs> emphasizing excellence and innovation, diversity, inclusion, and they're not just words to us at the Johnson Space Center. We've, we've discovered, and I think we've, we've emphasized down there, to be creative, to be innovative, as we have to be, given a constrained budget environment that Charlie's got to live with up there. We've got to be extremely innovative and creative in what we're doing, which means you've got to get a very diverse group of people uh, together on any team you put together. If you want to get uh, out-of-the-box thinking, uh, strange ideas come forward, you have to have an open mind to those. And one of, the, one of the criticisms we had of the Johnson Space Center for many years is that we, were, uh, we had a not invented here attitude. We did things that nobody else did. Why would we listen to anybody else? Uh, one of the things I learned in industry is go out and benchmark what else is out there. You're going to be shocked uh, at what other people are doing, not just in the technical world, uh, but in finance and human resources and everything else. There's some really clever people out there. We have an advantage at NASA. Okay? We can't pay for everything, but we can barter our brand name. People love to work with NASA uh, and be able to tell their boards of directors and so forth, uh, their regents, if you will, we're partnering with NASA. And they will share information that we just can't afford to go buy right now. And we're, boy, are we trying to maximize that uh, every, every opportunity. Um, I want to emphasize the International Space Station. I'm so proud uh, of the team, uh, the shuttle team, the International Space Station team that has completed final assembly of the International Space Station. It is an amazing technical accomplishment uh, as well, and the research are going on up there uh, just boggles the mind. We've celebrated the 10th anniversary of continuous human presence on the International Space Station. Uh, and it's important to us to keep a six-person crew up there uh, as often as we possibly can because the research is, is ongoing. Again, let me emphasize we have five space agencies and 15 countries uh, participating in the International Space Station. We've got control centers, as I was telling Charlie, we've got control centers all over the world participating one degree or another. Now, that's amazing. When we had to abandon that's not the right word. And we had to leave for Hurricane Rita. Well, we abandoned. We just ran like crazy. <laughs> uh, it, uh, it was really a smooth transition. Uh, the Moscow Control Center took over uh, and, it, and just seamless uh, activity. And we've had to do that a few times now as transition uh, work up there. Uh, so I think the microgravity research that we're doing on the space station uh, is so important to wherever we're going to go. And someday, I'm convinced, someday the administration and Congress will agree on where we're going to go. Uh, and we're going to be ready. Wherever it is they agree we're going to go, uh, JSC and the team out there uh, are going to be ready to go. So I'll uh, cut it short a little bit. I do want to emphasize that we're about to celebrate our 50th anniversary at the Johnson Space Center. 50 years ago, they broke ground, started building a fantastic facility down at the Johnson Space Center. Uh, it's been a terrific 50 years for us, uh, and I'm excited because I, I think the next 50 years are going to be even better. Uh, I'm envious that I'm not going to be around in 50 years. Let's see, I'd be 100 and we would be 100 and we'll make it. We'll, make it. <laughs> well, Charlie's always been the eternal optimist. That may be, that may be stretching it a little bit. Uh, That's right. Well, you're younger than I am. I keep telling him to treat his elders, these elders, with a little more respect. But <laughs> hadn't worked in 40 some years, so we'll see. Uh, again, I want to uh, brag a little bit about my team at the Johnson Space Center and all the members of the team that we have here. I couldn't be prouder of what they've accomplished uh, with the whole shuttle program. Uh, they're keeping focused on the shuttle program while we fly out these last two missions. And they're doing amazing work on the International Space Station, including certifying it now to fly 
well past 2020, which I think is so important to the whole world out here. Thank you for your time today. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>